I have never met anyone or anything that had a hold on me the way that that did. That took over my life. Hey guys, um, welcome back to my channel. It is Brittany Jade here. And if you are new to my channel or if this is the first video that you're seeing on my channel, I apologize for such heavy content and such a heavy topic. Um, but I'm hoping that you clicked on this video because you want some sort of inspiration or you're curious or maybe you know someone who's struggling and you just want some sort of encouragement or you just wanna feel like you're not alone in the situation in whatever it is you're going through. So I hope that that's why you clicked on this video and I hope that you can find some sort of hope or something like that. Uh, I also hope that this doesn't come as a shock value. If you're new to my channel, this is not the typical type of video that I would post and I wouldn't normally get so open and vulnerable about my past, but the Lord's really been putting it on my heart that this was the platform that I needed to extend this onto. If you're not new to my channel or if you're not new to any of my social media accounts, make sure that you're following me on Instagram. I'll have that linked right here on the screen for you guys as well as down below in the description box. But if you're not new to my channel and if you know me a little bit, if you know me a little bit at all, then you know that I am fairly open about the fact that I am in recovery. I've never been ashamed of the fact that I am in recovery. However, I have never really talked about it in depth in a public platform such as this or on my social media or in video form or anything like that. I've the, the most that I've done is maybe make a couple of like Instagram or Facebook posts or something like that, just talking about you know, how grateful I am that I found recovery and, and what it's done for my life and how it's positively impacted me, but I have never actually dove into what it was like for me um, in this platform. Obviously, I'm a grateful member of Alcoholics Anonymous, so I've shared my story plenty of times. I've also shared my story with my church family because they are really open to live testimony about what the Lord's done for them. And so they really encourage me to share. So those are the only two places that I've ever shared this. And so it is a little nerve wracking just because I feel like my family at church and then my family in AA, like they're used to hearing these kinds of stories where people overcome things like drug addictions and they're not shy to hear about drug addictions. And it can be kind of like shocking to people who are just normal or people who haven't dealt with this before or, you know, just have no idea that I even struggled with this in the past because I don't typically come across as someone who might have had this as an issue. And whenever I tell new people, they're usually um, kind of shocked, you know, a little bit at, as to be expected. Um, but again, like I said, this is just something that the Lord has put on my heart to share. I really feel like it's time. I have been in recovery now for four years. If you're watching this, I have four years clean and sober today, and it is only by the grace of God and the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous and my fellowship of women and my accountability partners and everyone in my life today who has helped me get to this point. That is what I owe my recovery to. And so I am so eternally grateful and I just felt like, okay, this is time. Like it's time for me to share and it's time for me to potentially help someone else or give someone who has a family member who's been struggling on and off, uh, you know, or still struggling to this day, it's important for me to give them some sort of encouragement that recovery is possible and it can happen. And so I think I'll just start a little bit from the beginning. I'll try not to make this a super long video uh, and I'm really nervous, so I'll try not to ramble too much, but fair warning, this could get pretty heavy and I'll try and keep it PG-13, but if you are a mom, because this is a mom content type channel, just make sure that your littles are maybe not right by you because there is going to be some discussion of drugs and alcohol in this video, so. Keep on watching guys and thanks so much for supporting this channel. 
please make sure that you like, comment, and if you're new, hit that subscribe button. It really helps out my channel. So let's get on to today's topic. Okay, uh, so I'd say that I was your normal rambunctious child. I grew up with my mom and I did not know my biological dad. Um, and I guess from pretty early on, I always kind of felt like I had like a hole in my heart from not having like a whole family. Um, and in my house, I had a really good upbringing, you know, I like I had a fairly decent upbringing, like we didn't live in poverty or anything like that. And, um, you know, my mom, she worked her butt off to make sure that we had like everything that we ever wanted and needed and things like that. So we weren't lacking in any department of the nature. When I say we, I say me, and, I mean me and my brother. Um, we weren't lacking in anything like we had. I recall it's it's the holiday time right now when this video is going up. So, you know, we always had huge Christmases and birthday parties and things like that. And um, we always had a lot of material things, but I definitely always felt a lack of like human connection or I guess love or something like that because I didn't have my father in my life. I never had like a positive male role model in my life from early on. Uh, and my mom married uh, my brother's dad and uh, I won't speak illy on him because he did pass away last year so I won't speak ill on the dead but um, we did not have a good relationship and there was a lot of abuse that happened um, in the house during the time that he was there um, and that's all I'm gonna say on that uh, and I feel like because of what I experienced during those early years in my life and what went on in my home. There was a lot of untreated like trauma essentially. And so I feel like that trauma kind of carried me through my young childhood, tweenhood type stage. And that along with uh, not really feeling like I had a whole family and not having like the positive male role model and my father around in the picture, I felt a real sense of unworthiness and I had a lot of self-confidence issues. I know that it seems probably now that I can like walk into a room and I'm like really outgoing and social and I love connecting with new people, but I wasn't always this way. Um, and I feel like pretty early on, I made an attachment with food. And I always say that food was my first addiction because I would find so much relief in eating and relief from like emotional hangups, relief from feelings of sadness or loneliness, um, you know, even when I was in a good mood, when things were going really well or happy or a celebration, I would eat and eat and eat. And I couldn't shut off, you know, my desire to like eat food and I would sneak food. And it's really weird um, because I can't believe that this went on for so long and I, you know, no one around me really knew what was happening. This wasn't something that was heavily discussed when I was a child, like childhood traumas and like, overeating and like things to look out for in your kids like it wasn't something that was as discussed like as it is now so it went just unnoticed and I was a pretty overweight kid <laughs> I have been obese like pretty much most of my life and um you know which aided in my self-consciousness and my low self-esteem and so I was always seeking like the next best thing to fill this void that I had in my heart. And I did that through like trying to seek out like unhealthy friendships or like attaching to people so strongly. And when they didn't give me back that sense of attachment, it was like, I was just begging for any kind of emotional connection with like friends or with family, with, you know, anyone that I could with boys and I just always wanted to feel loved and I struggled with feeling like I wasn't loved and like I wasn't worthy. And um, when I got into like middle school, that's when I really started experimenting with drinking. I remember me and the neighbor girl who lived across the street from me, her dad had a liquor cabinet and it was like the sixth or seventh grade. We were like 12 or 13 years old at this time. 
and we snuck into her dad's liquor cabinet and we filled up these water bottles with like alcohol and we walked like a mile to school. So we were, we got drunk on the way to school at like 12 years old and we got caught because we ended up like giving the other kids at school like swigs of our water bottles and like everybody was acting super drunk and we threw the water bottles away and eventually we got caught and we all, we had to go to like this dare class or like this drug and alcohol class. And like, I don't know why my mom never thought it was weird that I like was getting drunk at like six in the morning, six, seven in the morning at 12 years old. Like, hello, like that's a red sign. <laughs> that's a red flag right there. Um, but yeah, that was my first experience like drinking alcohol and from there, like it just kind of went on from there. So right, boom, like I took, I hit the ground running like in the sixth grade where like I started like smoking joints with the kids in school. Like I attached to the bad group of kids at school, like not bad group of kids, but just like the troubled kids. Like I, I started smoking joints and like smoking weed and drinking alcohol with them. And any time I could be around some type of drug or alcohol like I was there like I started skipping classes at this point and just kind of like sneaking around and um that's kind of where I like found my home with like the unruly like it was like the goth kids or like the it was like the outcast crowd that I found my home in and I had a few like regular friendships but I find that during this period in my life I really ruined a lot of the friendships that I had with like the good kids because I had formed just such a horrible like outlook on life and I was just a really negative person to be around during this time and I look back on it now and I realize I go okay this is why this person like didn't want to be friends with me anymore because I was just you know, like smoking weed and drinking alcohol and stuff like that and just being like an overall negative Nancy type person. Um, so fast forward into high school. High school is where I found a lot of my independence because I was able to start working and my mom was really sick during this time. She had an injury at work which um, put her pretty much out of commission. She had to have several surgeries and it seemed like she was always sick or in bed or sleeping or like, you know, drugged up on her medications during this time because she had sustained like a really bad neck injury. She was a nurse. And so I utilized a lot of this time, like with not having much par parental supervision to just drink and party. And it was really crazy. Cause when I look back on it, like my four years in high school are such a blur. I had such good grades. Like I was always really smart academically. Like I, I never fell behind in school with like grades and stuff like that. Like I prided myself on having really good grades, taking honors and AP classes. I actually was granted the Bill Gates Grant Scholarship, which is a fully funded four year university scholarship. And I remember just thinking like, I have no idea how I'm getting such good grades in school because I would always skip class or you know, I just would party, party, party all weekend. Like I don't remember during those four years of high school how I got stuff done. Like I have no idea. Like that is just the grace of God right there because I feel like I was drunk or high like 75% of my high school career. And I was also like on the cheerleading squad and I did running start two years. So I like wasn't even in my high school anymore after I had finished all of my basic requirements. I was taking classes at the community college. I don't know how I did half of this stuff with the amount of partying that I was doing. And I remember like the coolest thing that I had thought about in high school is I want to be voted um, life of the party in the yearbook, like senior year. That was like this huge thing. And I actually won that award like in my senior year in the yearbook, it says that I was life of the party. And it's crazy to think that that was like my biggest aspiration, like not like getting into college, which I did, I got into college. Um, not like, you know, being like most likely to succeed or something like that. Like just, I wanted to be known as like the party girl. Like I was the cheerleader slash socialite slash fallout drunk person and that's what I aspired to be during that time frame in my life and I was a heavy drinker at this point like I could out drink some of the boys in my class and it just smoked a bunch of weed and 
you know, it was just really crazy and foggy. And it wasn't until I got to university, the after high school, I went to University of Washington, where my drug and alcohol use kind of picked up. And at this point, I started to abuse um, like prescription medications. Like a lot of people used Adderall at college because you know we're all college students trying to get work done and trying to like stay up and like live off minimal sleep and like shitty carbs and um, stuff like that. So I started taking those and um, trying to like keep up with my studies and it was like really difficult. And I also um, started experimenting with like cocaine and stuff during this time because that's what everybody was doing there. And it was just like a whole new world of drug use. And um, I think my second year at UW is when I had my first experience with some type of drug induced psychosis and my parents uh, jumped in at this point because I was I was failing to thrive and my roommates at the time were really concerned with me because I had had a psychosis event and it led to a suicide attempt. And uh, my parents were called and they took me home um, because I was no longer able to like successfully take care of myself. And they put me into an outpatient program and this was my first like treatment type experience and I have gone to treatment several times so um I kind of faked my way through that they had put me on this medication in the treatment in the outpatient treatment center that I went to they put me on this medication called antabuse and on antabuse you cannot drink like you can't even use mouthwash because any form of alcohol will make you extremely sick and I still tried to drink on the antabuse and I got really deathly sick and just nothing could stop me from wanting to drink and party. Like that was just my life. I wanted to escape from the realities of who I was as a person. I just was not happy. I could not look myself in the mirror. I was just a wreck. Um, like who tries to drink on a medication that clearly states you'll get sick when you drink? Um, someone who has a problem. And so, I never, I didn't finish that outpatient. I kind of like, I think I like talked my parents out of it. Like I told them that I was like doing really well. Like I was, I was better or something like that. Um, so yeah, shortly after that, like I, my drinking really picked up at this point. And in between this time, like, you know, like a bunch of other things were going on in my life. And, uh, you know, I, I had my first child at 22, 21. I had my first child at 21 and, um, I tried to like do the whole mom thing and I just couldn't get the drinking under control and my son's father drank a lot also so we did a lot of drinking together. Um, so like the following year like eventually I got caught drinking and driving and this was the first time that I had been arrested and I had any type of real consequence from my drinking. And I spent a night in jail and I ended up having to do like two days in jail or something like that for this offense. But I had to get the interlock system on my car, which is like a blow and go, you know, one of those things. So I ended up, I had the blow and go in my car for 18 months. Now this is really crazy because I still drank while I had the blow and go in my car and I was still able to drive. I did things like I knew that if I had a shot of alcohol, like if I had a shot of clear liquor, that I would be able to start my car in one hour and six minutes. Like I had it down to a science when I would be able to drive after drinking. Like, so I would time it. I'd be like, okay, if I drink three shots really quick in three and a half hours, I'll be able to drive. Like crazy stuff. I knew like when I woke up in the morning after a hard night of drinking, like I could just smell in my breath, like, okay, I'm not able to start my car. Like I've got to eat and like, just craziness, you know, like this is how I lived my life for like 18 months, like just trying to like time it, drink, time it, drink. And eventually I got tired of doing that. So I upped my ante again. And I think the first time that I was ever introduced to any opiates, I was working at a restaurant in SeaTac um, and a friend, you know, had these pills and was like, hey, like these are uh, Percocets and the first time that I tried a Percocet, I was hooked. Um, I have never met anyone or anything 
that had a hold on me the way that that did. That took over my life. Um, um, I'm sorry. Uh, I get a little emotional thinking about it because I feel like how could I be so, how could I have such a lack of willpower? Um, but I understand, you know, like I have the disease of addiction and, um, you know, like there was no telling my mind not to. Uh, I, from that point on, I did like any and everything to secure that high. And that is really like where the depths of addiction will take you. Um, from that point on, like it was just game on. Like somebody showed me different methods of using the drug. And from there on, it was just like game on, downhill from there. Like things declined pretty rapidly in my life, like where like I wasn't taking care of my kid anymore and um, I wasn't able to like keep my job anymore. And like I was doing like weird shit, like stealing and you know, things that were totally not who I was like inside, like I became like a really ugly person um, on the inside and my character traits changed and just who I was on the outside changed. Um, yeah, and you know, that's just, that was a really dark place in my life. And so I went to treatment actually. My I told my parents like, yeah, I need some help. Like I'm not able to like put these pills down. Like I have this problem. Like I remember my mom like opened up this drawer in, in, in her house where I was staying at the time. And there was just like all of this tin foil and like black and like she just freaked. And um, from then like I had to get really open and honest about like my struggles and like that I wasn't able to like stop using these pills. So they put me into inpatient and I went to Lakeside Milam inpatient in um, Burien. Uh, and that was my first inpatient stay. And then I, I got kicked out after two weeks because I was like, doing stuff that I wasn't supposed to do in treatment. And it was just crazy. I got kicked out. And uh, the first night that I got kicked out of that inpatient center was the first night that I ever tried heroin. Because one of the girls who I was in treatment with, she got out of treatment, like she had graduated the treatment program or whatever that same day that I got kicked out. And I had already gotten like all of these girls contact information and stuff like that. And so I hit this girl up and I was like, yeah, you know, like, what's up, let's hang out. And that was the first time that I ever tried heroin. And th that was kind of, um, it was crazy because the entire time I was in that inpatient program in Burien, I was like, oh, I'm not as bad as these girls because like all, everybody there was there for heroin. And I was like, oh, I'm not as bad because like I've never tried heroin before. Like I'm not that bad. Like I'm just here for some pills. Like I still have my shit together. You know what I mean? Um, even though I was like falling apart at the seams and in an inpatient facility at like 23 years old, you know, um, I just, I couldn't cope with the fact that I had like a serious issue. Like I didn't make the connection until I got out. And then that's when I started to abuse the heroin. And that was, oh God, I mean, that just was really ugly, like really ugly. Like I wasn't allowed to stay at my mom's house anymore. Hold on. I got to get my baby. Hey guys, this is one of my little miracle babies right here. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, where was I? So yeah, I just couldn't make the connection that I had like a serious issue because I hadn't tried the heroin yet. And so when I tried it that first night, I was like, okay, this is why everybody had upgraded from these really expensive pills to this drug. And from then on, like things really rapidly declined in my life where I was like doing things where you know, I, I said I would never do like, oh, I would never do that. Like I was doing those things, like really degrading things that really questioned, like I would look at myself in the mirror and not recognize who I was type things. And, um, you know, that went on for about eight or nine months or something like that. Um, like I was not able to hold a job. I was not able to be like a productive person in society. 
I, I remember I had enrolled in um, aesthetic school during this time period in my life. And I, I, like I said, I was always able to really thrive academically no matter where I was at in my um, alcohol or drug addiction. And so I did graduate from aesthetic school, but I was like a full blown addict during the entire time. And um, it's really funny because I, I told some of the girls, you know, after the fact, because right after I graduated is when I went to treatment, um, I told some of the girls like after the facts like when I went to treatment like you know like yeah I have this problem and like they were all really shocked you know because I was still able to hold it together like in the appearance department I feel like I always tried to like take pretty good care of what I looked like and I like to stress that a lot like sometimes you're not always the bum under the bridge like when you have a drug or alcohol problem like sometimes you're able to hold your appearance together and I don't want that to ever be like a factor like I think people have this idea in their heads that like oh like you couldn't possibly have this problem because like you look normal or you look fine or you're going to work every day or you're going to school or you're doing this and that like it's not about what you look like really it's about like what you feel like on the inside and I felt empty like I felt like less than a whole person like I felt like I was unworthy and I felt like this was the life that I deserved like I didn't deserve any better and um yeah so it was on it was like the month before my birthday and I knew that I was turning 25 and I wasn't or I knew I was turning 26 and that I wasn't gonna have any health insurance anymore and so I was like frantically searching for treatment because I just woke up one day and I was like, look, like that was the last shred of wits that I had in me. I was like, I'm gonna lose my health insurance and I'm gonna end up like having to go to the Salvation Army or I'm gonna end up being the bum under the bridge because I'm not gonna be able to get help. So like, let me try and figure this out so that I can get help. Um, and I started frantically searching for treatment and um, I was able to find treatment but they weren't able to get me in until uh, like around Thanksgiving time, which was like two weeks after my 26th birthday. So God bless my parents. They paid for the gap insurance on my health plan for like an extra month, which was like two grand or something crazy just so that I could get help. And I knew like this is my last opportunity to get it together. This is the only chance I have to save my life. And I still was kicking and screaming the entire way because when it actually came time to go and like check myself in, like I was scared. I was afraid like, cause I, I have never lived my life like without using drugs or alcohol. Like how was I gonna be social? How was I going to um, make friends? Who was I gonna be friends with? Because all of my friends like to go out and party. Sorry buddy. Okay. He's hungry. Um, because all of my friends like they're, in the party scene like they're not gonna want to hang out with me if I'm like boring and sober you know um so I like did stupid things like I packed a I packed a swimsuit in my suitcase to treatment because I just didn't want to go and I was just trying everything like oh yeah if I like don't pack myself any clothes and like they're gonna have to come and get me stupid um so yeah I checked myself into uh detox at Fairfax detox in Kirkland Washington um, the day before Thanksgiving, um, in 2015 and Thanksgiving day, uh, which was November 26, 2016 or 2015 is uh, my first day in recovery. And, uh, that's my sober date. Um, and it was grueling. Detoxing was grueling. When I look back on it, uh, it was Thanksgiving day. So there were no, there weren't a lot of doctors like in the facility. So I remember I had to do like my first 48 hours of detox without any medications to help me. And I would not wish that pain on like my worst enemy. Um, I ended up doing a Suboxone taper while I was in detox, like after like day three or something like that. And I did like 10 days in detox or something. And then I went to the inpatient program. I went to residence 12, which was an all women's, um, residential treatment facility and I owe my life to that place. That place saved my life. Um, I love Residence 12 and this is actually their last month that they are going to be open under their original surname of Residence 12. 
because they were private and there's just no money in it. Um, but I owe my life to that place and I met so many incredible women and I've made so many lifelong friends out of that place and I still go there to this day. Like when you guys are watching this video, I'm headed to a meeting that Residence Falls holds so that I could get my four year coin. Um, I cannot believe that I am four years clean and sober. Like if you would have told me five years ago that I'd be sitting here today with four years clean, I would have like pfft, laughed in your face because I was, it's such a point of despair and in such a state of hopelessness and withdrawal from reality. Like there's no way I would have believed you. Um, there's just no way, like there was no way I was getting clean and sober. There was no way I was gonna live my life without drinking a drop of alcohol. There was no way that I was gonna get by without abusing doctors for pain medication. There was no way that I was gonna get through life without opiates because opiates were life. Like there was just no way, there's just no way that I would have ever believed you. And the life that I have today is nothing short of a miracle. Um, for those of you that don't know, I met my husband in recovery and I met him really early on. Honestly, I think I only had like 30 days sober when I met Taylor, like stupid early. And he had like four years clean at this time. So like he was pretty thick in recovery, in his own recovery. And um, yeah, we got pregnant really early, like dumb. When you're in early recovery, you try to replace like the drug with like people. And I was, I was still in that frame, but I don't know, when I met Taylor the first time, I, I remember telling my best friend, like, that's gonna be my husband, like, I love him. And sure enough, hello, that man is my husband. Um, but we had, we uh, got pregnant with our daughter, Novali, really early. I'm gonna burp him and then I'm gonna come back because I don't wanna do this on film. Okay, I'm back. So, um, yeah, we got pregnant with my daughter, Novali, really early. Like, I literally had, like, three months clean at this time. Two or three months clean. And I remember being so afraid, like, to tell him, to tell my family, to, like, even tell myself to, like, accept it. Um, and I remember I went to the Planned Parenthood to find out, like, to confirm that I was actually pregnant because I thought I was tripping. I was like, there's no way that I'm pregnant. Um, and they gave me like the estimated due date chart or whatever like that. You know how they do like that based on your last period and whatever, whatever. Um, and on the paper, like I came home and I was showing my roommates cause I lived in a clean and sober house at this time with like other sober women. And I showed one of my roommates, Allie, the paper and she was like, oh my God, dude, look at the due date. It says that you're due on November 26, 2016. And she's like, that's your one year. And, um... I was like, dude, that's crazy, right? Like, and at this time I was really developing like my spirituality and like I had started going back to church and like I had started like getting back in good with God, you know, like just really trying to, I was on this spiritual journey to like find myself, you know? And so like, I felt like God was really revealing a lot to me. And in that moment, I felt like confirmation in my pregnancy, like, okay, like I can do this with or without the guy, with or without my family support. Like I got to do this. Like, this is a sign, you know, like I need to stay sober. Like I didn't know how I was going to stay sober. I had had failed treatment attempts before. Like I had gone to treatment once before and failed. Like I had gone to outpatient before and failed. Like I had gone to you know, I had gone through it. I had seen counselors, therapists, like nothing could keep me sober, you know? Um, and so I, I told Taylor, like I, he had gone on like a, uh, like a snowboarding trip with his family to Canada or whatever. And like, he was gone. So it, I had gone like three or four days, five days or something like that without telling him. And so he finally came and I was like, dude, I'm pregnant. And like, like, you don't have to stay basically. And he was just like, okay. He's like, I'm here. Like, we're here, we're doing this, like, we're doing this together. And um, I love him so much. Like he was just, um, sorry. Um, get yourself like a tailor, you guys. Like I cannot stress enough. Like that was another godsend for me was meeting my husband. Cause 
he has always like really supported me and always been there for me and like walked me through like early recovery, which is like crazy for anybody to go through like lots of hormonal changes, but just being pregnant on top of that. And like, really he stood by my side through everything. And you know, he's always shown me like love and grace and respect and dignity and like things that I had never seen from a man before. Um, so I'm just so grateful that I met him that you know, I wouldn't recommend like getting pregnant or having a baby or getting in a serious relationship to anybody in early recovery, but that's just a part of my story. And I am so grateful that that was with Taylor because he was really a part of my saving grace. Um, and so I did, you know, the estimated due date on your pregnancy thing, like that never happens, right? But I had my daughter on my one year clean and sober and she is my miracle child like she saved me and we will always have that in common so when you guys are watching this video today on my four years my daughter just turned she's turned three years old today also so every year on my sober birthday we celebrate her birthday because that's the day she was born obviously um and it's not even about me anymore like really like i spend the whole day celebrating her and i just like you know take a piece of myself to like thank god throughout the day at the end of the night or whatever or, you know i'll go to a meeting that night and get my coin and whatnot um because really it's not even about me it's about my children and just you know my family and like the things that god's blessed me with but i would not have any of this without recovery um, I would not have any of this without making that decision to turn my will and my life over to God and, you know, to check myself into that treatment facility and like walk into treatment with a suitcase full of like sundresses and a bathing suit in the middle of November, December, you know, um, I wouldn't have had any of what I have today if I didn't open my mouth and get a sponsor and go to meetings and ask for help and ask for the willingness to learn something about myself and how to fix that broken little girl that was on the inside of me that was constantly seeking something to fill this void in my heart that only God could fill and I am so much more confident I stand here with my health help with my head held high I don't stand in shame of my past of everything that I've done you know I stand here today as a woman who just walks with her head held high who walks in the glory of God and what he's blessed me with. I I share my story to help someone who might be struggling, who might think like there's no way that I could ever live my life a day without drugs or alcohol and I'm here to tell you that you can. And I'm here to tell you that I've done it and I I'm doing it and I can't even I can't even explain how crazy it is that I have this amount of time like that I have gone this long without abusing anything. Um, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do any kind of drugs. I'm very open with all of my doctors about my addictions. Like I don't take any mind or mood altering medications, nothing. Like I live my life completely clean and sober and like that's the way that I plan to do it until I die. Um, so, yeah, I think I'm gonna end this video here. I hope that this video gave you guys some kind of encouragement. I hope that um, I was able to touch someone today. I hope that you guys are kind to me in the comment section. I hope that this video doesn't bring about anything crazy. I was really, really unsure about posting this on this platform because like I said, a lot of my videos are like mom content, family style content. And I didn't want to like throw a rift into it with this video. So I really feel like I'm taking a shot out here of like wrecking what I'm trying to build with like my brand. Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, with me staying on assignment and listening to, you know, what God has just told me to do, like I said in the beginning, he really placed this on my heart and told me like, I need to do this. I need to put this out there. I need to be open. I need to share this with other people. I need to let other people know that you know it's okay to be in this position that i'm in and look this way and let people know like yes i struggled and yes i have a testimony and yes i have a past but look what god can do 
Look what the program of Alcoholics Anonymous can do. Look what being open about my mental health problems and um, about being open about needing to go to treatment and needing to seek help from doctors, like look what that can do for you and look how that can turn your life around. And so I hope that by me sharing this, that I did that for you guys today. And I am just so, so, so grateful. And I'm thankful for all of you guys on this channel that support me. And I hope that you guys like this. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Please drop me a heart emoji down in the comments below and just let me know that you're there for me. Um, thank you so much everybody for four years clean and sober today. Thank you, God. And I hope that y'all enjoyed this. So. Have a great rest of your day. Bye. Can you say, Mommy's got four years? Mommy's got four years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.